In assessing Arthur Rackham, there is no need to compare his works with other artists in the era or other illustrators in the children's book genre. It's unnecessary to critique his work with dry analytical discernments. Arthur Rackham supersedes these critics by winning one of the greatest rewards possible by being part of the imaginations of millions of childhoods, including my own. What a Child Finds, at night, opening a hardcover book of Brothers Grimm's is a mixture of both strange and wholesome, a transcendental spring, a golden treasure. The Rackham line were Cockneys, and Arthur Rackham was proudly conscious of the fact. Thomas Rackham, Arthur's grandfather, was a schoolmaster who opened a private school in 1832. His only brother, Joseph, also kept private schools. Alfred Thomas Rackham, the father of Arthur Rackham, was born on 11th of July, 1829. The outbreak of the Crimean War in 1854 gave A.T. Rackham a chance of advancement. In wartime, the tasks of the Admiralty Court were greatly increased. It had just begun to document all naval matters. A.T. Rackham entered the civil service in the registry of the Admiralty Court and was soon extremely busy preparing the Declaration of War and other papers. Much was expected of his position and he worked earnestly. Once, while copying a document for the Queen's signature, he heard St. Paul's clock the heart of London, as Dickens called it, strike three in the morning. Having failed three times to fill the large sheet of gilt-edged paper without a mistake, he had to return to the office earlier than usual, only a few hours afterwards, to accomplish the feat. In September 1861, A.T. Rackham married Anne, second daughter of William Stevenson, a draper in Nottingham. They resided at 210 South Lambeth Road. In this house, all their 12 children were born. The two eldest died young. Then in 1866 came Margaret, who studied at Bedford College and became an examiner in the King's College civil service classes. Arthur was born on the 19th of September, 1867. Harris was born in 1868 and after a brilliant career at the City of London Schools and Christ College, Cambridge, was elected to a classical fellowship in the latter institution in 1894. The next two children, a girl and a boy, both died in their infancy. In 1873, Winifred was born. She became a school teacher and married a mathematician. Another girl who survived only a few months was born in 1875. The tenth child, Bernard, born in 1876, was to become keeper of the Department of Ceramics at the Victoria and Albert Museum. Stanley, born in 1877, studied agriculture and farmed in Canada. And Maurice, who was born in 1879, joined the Admiralty Registry in 1901. As a child, Arthur showed a gift for drawing and especially for fantastic subjects. Put to bed early, he smuggled paper and pencil with him and drew while the daylight lasted. When this was forbidden, he still managed to hide his pencil and draw on the pillows. A note to Arthur from his grandmother Stevenson when he was nine warmly congratulated him on his letter illustrated with caricatures. He entered the City of London School at the age of 12 in 1879. Arthur did not distinguish himself particularly by his studies, though he won several prizes, including one for mathematics in his last year. But he endeared himself to his masters by his humor and character and by his talent for drawing, which earned him the school prize, a portrait of himself by Herbert Dixie, the drawing master, which unfortunately has been lost. His caricatures of the masters were so successful that he asked to repeat one on the blackboard for the benefit of the whole class. In the autumn of 1884, he entered the Lambeth School of Art, but only part-time. There was no question of his studies in art interfering with the practicalities of working his way to a career. His old school teachers recommended him on the score of intelligence, industry, and character, 
and also remarking on his ability, knowledge, character, and gentlemanly bearing, saying further Mr. Arthur Rackham would be well suited for clerkship. Throughout the next seven years, Arthur built a career as an accountant for an insurance office with only the occasional illustration sent to the cheaper papers. His first crude published drawings had appeared in Scraps on 4th of October, 1884, illustrating the thesis, Mothers in Ceylon have a curious way of preventing their children from eating too much. A fine thread is tied round the child before it commences its meal, and when the thread breaks, the child is considered to have had enough. Another drawing in Scraps on 15th of November, 1884, shows a little boy and a cat both trying to get their feet into their mouths the cat with more success. His next drawing, published in Illustrated Bits, shows a frog representing the 1884 leap year. As early as 1887, Arthur was painting watercolors. A landscape of Winchelsea was accepted by the Royal Academy in 1888 and sold for two guineas. Throughout 1891, his work proved increasingly acceptable to the Pall Mall budget. In 1891 and 1892, there were few weeks in which his drawing was not represented in that paper. Sketches from the life of public personalities became one of his specialties, and these appeared more frequently after he left the insurance office in 1892 and joined the staff of the Westminster Budget. The larger format of the Westminster Budget gave him new scope. His drawings of well-known figures became a popular feature. Rackham portrayed many of the leading actresses, sportsmen, writers, and politicians of the day. The Queen and Mr. Gladstone were among his frequent subjects. He was often invited to events and called upon to celebrate royal occasions. Already he was demonstrating his mastery of line. An artist so skilled and conscientious was an asset to the Westminster budget, but there were moments, as with his disquieting full-page fantasy, The Influenza Fiend, in 1893, which unmistakably foreshadowed the fanciful and uniquely imaginative illustrator that Arthur was to become. From 1893 onwards, Arthur became increasingly occupied with book illustrations. Linking Rackham's name for the first time with a work of literary merit, Arthur's four halftone illustrations and cover design in the beggar staff style for the Dolly Dialogues by Anthony Hope was released in 1894. Soon afterward came other books including various gardening and nature books and standard romanticism for cloak and dagger novels. The fanciful gradually supplanted the conventional as Rackham's technique developed. Rackham had little liking or aptitude for the journalistic illustration then in demand. He also realized that the camera would soon supersede the artist in journalism. His success as an illustrator was veered in part by practical necessity. The first year of the new century marked a turning point in Arthur's career. 99 drawings in black and white with a colored frontispiece, his original illustrations for fairy tales of the Brothers Grimm. The book was immediately successful and its publication marked the beginning of lasting fame. Two new editions were called for within 10 years. At intervals from 1900 onwards, Rackham worked on the original drawings, partially or entirely redrawing some of them in color adding new ones in color and in black and white, and generally revamping them as a set until the final and best known edition of 1909 contained 40 colored illustrations and 55 line drawings. At this time there was a very large assorted output including Gulliver's Travels. Like his grim illustrations, as his reputation advanced, Arthur provided refurbished illustrations for the latter book.
he received strong encouragement to follow his inclination for fantasy from his fellow artist and future wife, Edith Starkey. When she and her mother were neighbors of his in Wycombe Studios, England's Lane, Hampstead, London. Her nephew, Walter Starkey's earliest memories of Rackham date from that year. Walter had arrived from Dublin, age six, on a visit to his grandmother's. My first impression of the painter was colored by the fairy stories my Aunt Edith told me at bedtime, he writes. His face was wizened and wrinkled like a ripe walnut, and as he peered short-sightedly at me out of his goggle spectacles, I thought he was one of the goblins out of Grimm's fairy tales. Dressed in his shabby blue suit and hopping about his studio in his carpet slippers, he reminded me of Rumpelstiltskin. But when he was armed with palette and paintbrushes, he became for me a wizard, who with one touch of his magic wand could people my universe with elves and leprechauns. He would take me out for walks over Primrose Hill or in Kensington Gardens where he would sketch the trees. And as he worked, he would tell me stories of gnomes who lived in the roots and churned butter out of the sap flowing from the knotted branches. This was the character of Arthur at the age of 33. As for his physical appearance, he lost his hair young. Except in bed, he was never without still or gold rimmed spectacles, of which he owned a great variety. He remained an alert person, well kempt, energetic, and punctual. Amateur theatricals were for many years a persistent interest. He not only designed scenery, but acted in performances as well. He kept himself fit with lawn tennis and exercise on a trapeze. He was active and precise both at work and at play. Edith Sarkey with a smooth pink complexion, large Irish blue eyes full of mischief, and snowy white hair from an early age was the perfect opposite of Arthur in character. She had a charm which proved popular, and if she was not conventionally beautiful, she gave the air of beauty. She made her friends laugh without ever really saying anything funny, and she could be personable with her sympathy and understanding. By the time she met Arthur, who was two months older than herself, Edith already knew much of the world. At the age of 16, her mother took her on a tour of Europe. They stayed for a time in Paris, where Edith studied art before going on to Germany, where she became engaged to a Prussian officer at Potsdam, which caused a major scandal when she broke off the engagement. After her father's death, she settled in Hampstead with her mother. Arthur admired her not only as a woman, but also as an artist, who was then achieving a notable reputation as a portrait painter. Although her career was cut short by ill health, she was an artist to be remembered. In their relationship, they fast became a harmonious duo. I wonder where Arthur is, Edith would say then appearing a moment later by her side as though he had popped up through a trap door, he was more staid than my aunt, and with his prim, precise English manner was an admirable foil when in company, she would always do her best to shock him," Walter Starkey later wrote. The first work that greatly advanced his fame in the years immediately following his marriage was an edition of Rip Van Winkle. With its 51 color plates published in 1905, this charming book decisively established Rackham as the leading illustrator of the Edwardian period. One does not know which to admire most, the superb artistry of his landscapes, the poetry of the scenes of Rip by the riverside, the charm of his children and fairies, or the grotesque groups of Henrik Hudson and his crew, one critic wrote. The book was issued in a limited edition and trade edition, while American, French, German, and other foreign editions were also produced, setting a pattern of publication to be followed for many years. The Little White Bird, published in 1902, introduced Peter Pan to the world. Though the book is different from the Peter Pan that we know today, Rackham could not have been contracted to a project more fitting or fashionable. Peter Pan in Kensington Gardens was 50 full-page illustration in color that became the best-selling Christmas book of 1906 and maintained its popularity for many later Christmases. Not the least part of the good fortune that follows Mr. Barry's steps is his choice of an illustrator. The Pall Mall Gazette writes, Mr. Rackham seems to have dropped out of some cloud in Mr. Barry's fairyland. 
sent by a special providence to make pictures in tune to his whimsical genius. From 1907 onward, his income fluctuated between 1,500 pounds and 3,500 pounds annually, or about 180 to 420,000 modern American dollars. Arthur's next commitment after Peter Pan was Alice in Wonderland, a work so completely identified with the drawings by John Tenniel that by many critics, alternatives seemed almost blasphemous. But the copyright for Alice expired in 1907 and Rackham was one of seven in England who began renewed illustrations. The disputed work produced a general opinion that Rackham made the greatest impression of all of Taniel's successors. Despite the original publisher of Lewis Carroll offering Arthur the job of illustrating through the looking glass before the copyright had expired, a remarkable gesture of approval, the mixed reviews disappointed Arthur, and he declined further work on the Alice series. Arthur's model for Alice was Doris Jan Domit, who told the story of her sittings. In the Mad Tea Party picture, she sat in Arthur's big winged back chair and the table was laid with Mrs. Rackham's best china. Miss Domit remembered asking, will she throw plates? Oh no, said Arthur, they've been broken already. To the chagrin of Edith, he had actually broken a few to get the details right. In a less controversial theme than Alice, in 1908, Arthur illustrated A Midsummer Night's Dream. Besides the severe scrutiny which comes to every artist at his level of popularity, the project was a success. One critic wrote, his gnarled trees and droves of fairies illustrated with generous detail gave a visual reality of the dream for thousands of readers. The pre-Raphaelite artist William D. Morgan, in a letter to Arthur, described his Midsummer Night's Dream as the most splendid illustrated work of the century so far. William D. Morgan would not be disappointed in 1909 when Rackham produced illustrations for Undine. The work was another step forward in Arthur's career, but most notably at this time, Arthur was now father of his daughter Barbara, born the year before in 1908. Much later in his life, Arthur gave an interview where he spoke generally about the importance of child development. I can only say that I firmly believe in the greatest stimulating and educative powers of imaginative, fantastic, and playful pictures and writings for children in their most impressionable years. A view that most, unfortunately, I consider has its opponents in these matter-of-fact days. Children will make no mistakes in the way of confusing the imaginative and symbolic with the actual nor are they at all blind to decorative or arbitrarily designed treatment in art, any more than they are to poetic or rhythmic form in literature. And it must be insisted on that nothing less than the best that can be had, any accepting or even choosing art or literature of the lower standard as good enough for children is a disastrous and costly mistake. Rackham's determination to maintain and to raise the standard of his work was constant. In 1910 and 1911, two series of illustrations were created. Based on the Wagner operas, The Rheingold and The Valkyrie, and also Siegfried and The Twilight of the Gods. Though the illustrations are for, as Rackham put it to a young fan, those who have finished the delightful adventure of growing up, the following years he returned to form and again illustrated children's books. Aesop's Fables in 1912 and Mother Goose in 1913. Also in 1913, Arthur produced a book of pictures, which as he described, the wayward visions that tease every true artist's mind while he bends over the day's work. The serendipitous survival of a set of blockmakers' proofs of the year 1913 gives an opportunity to witness Arthur's meticulous detail. He would often send proofs back and forth many times. He studied techniques seriously enough that he would even alter his own use of color and attempt to limit himself to those colors which reproduce most masterfully. Arthur's habit of constantly striving for perfection even through limitation proved prophetic when the war broke out in 1914. Unfortunately, no one individual could prevent the entire field of book production to decline in quality. 
However, wartime provided an opportunity for Arthur to patriotically contribute for publications including King Albert's book, Princess Mary's gift book, and the Queen's gift book, published in aid of the Crown's convalescent auxiliary hospitals. He also illustrated the Allies' Fairy Book in 1916. The poet Edmund Goss wrote the introduction to the Allies' Fairy Book and later wrote to Arthur about the illustrations. Their variety and ingenuity, and the delicacy of your fancy, and the romantic ardor of your mind were never more victoriously manifested. I am proud to be associated, though to so humble a degree, in a work so charming. The war years held other worries for Arthur. His wife now became seriously ill from a heart attack after a bout of pneumonia. She never recovered her full health and suffered from cardiac and nervous weakness for the rest of her life. Her painting had to be almost entirely abandoned. Arthur worked steadily through all these disturbances and besides numerous miscellaneous publications produced several books of lasting value during the war years. He is not usually remembered as an illustrator of Dickens, but A Christmas Carol was decidedly successful. In 1918, he illustrated Swinburne's poems The Springtide of Life. Following the war, he produced Some British Ballads in 1919, two volumes of Cinderella, and in 1920, The Sleeping Beauty. It was in 1920 when his earned income, with the inclusion of proceeds from American exhibitions, reached 7,000 pounds. With this prosperity, he acquired a country home, a Georgian Flint farmhouse at Houghton, near Arundel. Houghton House, warm, dignified, and beautiful, was opposite the George and Dragon Inn. The garden offered wide views over the Arran Valley and gave on to fields sloping to the River Arran, where Arthur used to fish. He was fond of fly fishing, a sport unknown to that river, and sometimes collected a crowd to watch him cast over the water. The only fish he could catch there were small and muddy. He taught his daughter to clean and cook these in the coals of a bonfire on the bank. Arthur, who never liked modern inventions, cheerfully accepted the antique house. A well instead of main water, candles instead of electricity, and vermin scurrying through the walls at night. Although he appreciated good company and met his social life with joviality, Arthur was naturally a quiet man with simple tastes and a tempered attitude to life. His lineage of a middle-class clerk was not hidden. No matter how prosperous he became, he was unable to easily spend money on pleasure. His only excuse for spending money were for health and for education. He firmly believed in a lifestyle centered around a work ethic and also for saving to assure the fundamentals of life. At some point, he did acquire the habit of a nightly glass of Marsala wine, a habit he kept throughout his life. Any other form of drinking he considered a luxury and he did not smoke. Arthur had no advanced appreciation of culinary pleasures, and always an Englishman, his favorite food was cold roast beef. A notable story is when an influential art dealer and prospective buyer once found him in his London studio at 3 o'clock in the afternoon eating sardines off a newspaper. When Arthur gaily described the encounter to his wife, Mrs. Rackham was horrified. Arthur believed in the virtues of newspaper for all sorts of uses, as blotting paper, as wrapping, for keeping warm in bed, for drying out damp shoes, as a tablecloth, and for filing. His notes and correspondences were neatly collected in folded copies of the Times, labeled in chalk on the outside. In 1921, a long-delayed edition of John Milton's Comus was released with Arthur's illustrations. Spanning the breadth of his artistic emotions, some pictures for Comus provoked unsettling drawings in what was for Arthur a disturbing vein. This was to be touched again later in illustrations for Edgar Allan Poe. In 1922 came Hawthorne's A Wonder Book, and in 1926 Arthur released an experimental style in The Tempest. 
Critics called the work refreshing and effectively modern. When Grimm's fairy tales were revived in separate new editions, Arthur for the first time utilized his popularity for commercial success by illustrating advertisements for Colgate in 1922, 23, and 24, advertisements for Enos Fruit Salts in 1928, and a chocolate box for Cadbury in 1933. The lucrative offers impeded the disappointment that soon came from the Royal Academy. In 1922, Arthur allowed to be voted into the Academy as an associate engraver, but had lost to the great H. Macbeth Rayburn by 26 votes to 11. Draftsmen were not eligible to be admitted into the Royal Academy until after Rackham's death. But an even more disappointment was the difficulty of publishing quality books in England. The realities of war dealt a blow to imaginative craftsmanship, particularly in Fairyland. And not so in the United States, where interest culminated from American publishers, collectors, and simple admirers. A group of students at a high school in Trenton, New Jersey was replied to by Arthur with encouragement and advice. If you possibly can, be makers and not dealers. Aim at the highest quality in your work. Go on improving it. Never be satisfied with it. Aim at taking pleasure in work for its own sake and not for what you can make out of it. In 1927, with encouragement from his fans, Arthur traveled to the United States. His first impressions of New York City were negative, as the 60-year-old Arthur found it extremely noisy. To live here must vulgarize an artist, Arthur wrote, but also said that everyone is excessively kind and that the artists there were extraordinarily friendly as well. One of the most interesting results of the trip was a commission from the New York Public Library to create a series of watercolors to be exhibited for the Spencer Collection. Arthur summed up the trip to America as well as his general feeling toward the changing era in a letter written in the summer of 1929. I need not say what a difference the war has made. The market is now divided up among sacks of cheaply produced and relatively inexpensive books. The trades have so settled it, not without great consideration and the difficulty of bringing out a rather better book is so great as to be all but prohibitive. I recently went over to the States to see for myself exactly what the conditions were there and found them much the same. I might tell you of one experience. One of the great firms of New York agreed, after much deliberation, to do a book for me, but on hearing that other illustrations of mine were arranged to appear the same season, they at once withdrew their offer. As a matter of fact, the better class books do not sell half the number that they did before the war, and there is not as much profit to be made out of each book as there was, so neither publishers nor illustrators are having much of a time. By 1929, Mrs. Rackham's declining health made it necessary for the Rackham's to leave Houghton House. Arthur now built a house on the common at Limpsfield, Surrey. Stylegate was comfortable, easy to run, and with a delightful garden. Though the country home was replaced by conventional suburbs, Arthur worked on enthusiastically as ever. He illustrated for Ruskin in The King of the Golden River, Christina Rossetti in Goblin Market, Edgar Allan Poe, and also the Arthur Rackham Fairy Book. But the undertaking that meant most to him in the early 30s was his edition of Hans Andersen's Fairy Tales, a project that had been in his mind for many years. In the autumn of 1931, Arthur and his daughter Barbara traveled to Copenhagen to interview those who knew Hans Christian Andersen, including an old lady who, as a child, had hidden under a table in order to hear Andersen himself reading some newly written stories. Arthur sketched busily both in town and country, visiting farms and local museums. It is rather fatiguing, he wrote to his wife. I have to talk so much and behave myself so well all the while, taking notes and notes for dear life. But everyone is most delightfully friendly and anxious to help and are greatly interested in what I have to do. After Fairy Tales was released, the English novelist Hugh Walpole wrote that it was the best picture book of 1932. Speaking of Arthur, he has risen nobly to his subject. He has acquired a new tenderness and grace. His fantasy is stronger than ever. Published in the following year was the Arthur Rackham Fairy Book. 
The illustrations were all new, though it was not the first time, as Arthur wrote, that he had illustrated several of these old favorites of the nursery in the 30 years and more that my work has led me through Enchanted Lands. Between his illustrations for the Pied Piper in 1934 and his drawings for Pierre Gant in 1936 came Poe's Tales of Mystery and Imagination in 1935, one of the few commissions that Arthur did not really enjoy. He was concerned to match his illustrations to the macabre writing, but later said that his pictures were now so horrible that he was beginning to frighten himself. American publisher George Macy called on Rackham in the summer of 1936, the pair sat in the studio for a long while, talking vaguely of what he might do. Macy eventually opened the suggestion, what about the wind in the willows? Macy recounts, immediately a wave of emotion crossed his face. He gulped, started to say something, turned his back on me, and went to the door for a few minutes. When he came back, he explained that for years he had earnestly hoped to illustrate the book and had always regretted that he had refused the invitation from publishers nearly 30 years before. He welcomed the opportunity offered by Macy Holy, persistent that he must illustrate The Wind in the Willows. Slowly, the drawings for The Wind in the Willows neared completion. The last drawing of all to be finished was that of Rat and Mole loading their boat for the picnic. Rackham's daughter remembers his great exhaustion and the extreme difficulty he had in getting it done. When he had thought he finished it, he suddenly discovered that there were no oars in the boat. Barbara tried to persuade him that this was a detail that did not matter, but he insisted that everything must be right and with great diligence he altered the drawing to include the oars. After he had done this, he took to his bed. Thank goodness that is the last one, and so it proved to be so. Arthur Rackham died on the 6th of September, 1939, a few days before his 72nd birthday. Out of Arthur's entire work, The Wind in the Wills is considered by most his happiest drawings.